I will set up a Facebook page for this class that there. Um, th since I don't have inter internet on this computer here right now, I there's an internet cable here that I could plug into that there, but that cable doesn't work half the time, so I have to go find another cable to connect to the internet that there. But there will be an internet page, and I'll show you how to get to that, or an internet, a Facebook page. Actually, if you do a search on, for me, you, You'll find two Facebook pages. One is a picture of myself and my wife. That's the one that I use for school. So if you just friend me on that there, and I don't post anything other school-related stuff that there, and then I will set up a page for, for this class that you would then ask to join that page. And that's where I'll put announcements such as, this is this week's homework assignment, it's due when, that there. This cl class is canceled this day because of whatever reason <laughs> that there. You know, my birthday party <laughs> out there, but uh, you know, visa run for a friend of mine going to Sing you know Singapore. His daughter, you know, they're, they're, they're they they just moved to the U.S. and they're still trying to work out the daughter's visa situation. Strange situation that there. You know, it's the uh, daughter, the mother's Malaysian, and the father's American, but because the daughter is born in the U.S., she's not considered Malaysian, even though her mother's Malaysian. So they're trying to work out how the, the daughter can move to Malaysia with the, with the parents. <laughs> that there because the parents moved to Malaysia, but now, the, you know, getting the daughter here to move here. So it's an interesting situation. Immigration in any country is a pain in the neck. Trust me, I've done three green card applications in the U.S. over the years, and they took many, many hours. And I'm still working on my. Out there, and I'm told that it takes me about five to ten years to get a permanent residency here. Out there, out there. So you see, yeah, it takes a very long time. I'm on a year-to-year -year visa because my wife's Malaysian out there. So if my if my wife happens to throw me out, then I have no legal status, and I have to go go back home out there. And unfortunately, I have no home in the U.S. My home is now here. I sold my house and my car and shipped all my furniture to Malaysia, so I have no more home left in the U.S. My home is down Dakota KL here about, I think, I think I live about five kilometers from campus here, ten kilometers from campus. That there, I don't know if any of you know where Uptown is. Yeah, I, I live very close to Uptown. Matter of fact, too close to Uptown. That there. You might hear me make comments about Uptown. I, I have an opinion that's not popular, but anybody that decided a market open from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. probably ought to be taken out and shot out there. I mean, of course, that's the American mindset. We all like to have guns, everyone's opinion. And I've never owned a gun, by the way, <laughs> out there. I've never had a firearm, but we, but the idea of having a night market until 3 in the morning in a residential neighborhood just didn't, doesn't seem like a smart idea. That there, but I'm far enough away, it doesn't bother me. Okay, this class has got two purposes one is to teach you how to program in C, and the other is to teach you a little bit about MATLAB. Okay, MATLAB, it, you know, C programming is where I'm going to probably spend about 10 to 12 weeks out of our 14 weeks because it's the more difficult topic. MATLAB, it, once you no C, MATLAB is extremely easy. That there, so 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 that there. In our my old curriculum in the U.S. and I keep saying, you know, my old school. I've been I've been gone for two years and I'm officially retired. So that there, but I'm still attached as professor emeritus to, to my old school. So so I can still talk like it's still my school. That there, since I'm still attached to it on an emeritus status. Our program used to require a first semester course in Visual Basic, then a second semester course in MATLAB, and then a third semester course in C. That there, we've co combined it all into one course here on this campus. That there, my personal preference would be not to teach C as our first language. That there, C is a cryptic language. It's hard to learn programming techniques the first time. That there. There are much better first languages than C. Uh, unfortunately, EAC, the Engineering Accreditation Council here in Malaysia, and the mindset of a lot of the 
engineers is that C is the programming language that people use, therefore we should, you know, it's the one you should be teaching. And you're electrical engineers, so you don't need a lot of programming, so just one course in C is enough. But C is a very difficult language as a first programming language. I will warn you that from the first minute. We will try to make it as painless as possible at there. And C in programming is something that I've found, at least since the two years I've been in UDKL, this is my fourth semester here, plus the short semesters and the transfer degree courses. So I've I've taught at least probably five, six sessions here at there. There, and this is probably my third or fourth time teaching the C course right here. I think the third time teaching the C course. But there, I started off teaching other things at there. But the uh, thing about the uh, that I notice is that in general, students on this campus have trouble with programming. <laughs> you know, and you're shaking your head, yes. Yeah, the programming is not your favorite thing to do, right? True, true that too. I personally took the program. Oh, I lost my projector, which, okay. I think my cable may be going bad. Right there. Okay, right there. I, I personally enjoy programming. I have worked for industry a number of times where my primary job function was programming that there. I'm not a computer science major, you know, so I don't consider myself a programmer by trade. My background is electrical engineer, electronic engineering that there I hear that there. I've done mostly embedded work that there. When I say embedded work means that I design microprocessor based systems to go into everything from Washing machines, the potato sorters, the tomato sorters, the sauna buoys that track submarines, you know, which has a lot of signal processing. And that, you know, that was probably the most high-end project that I ever worked on. That there, that there, that was for the for the Navy. There, that was where I started. I, I've worked. I've done pr programming for applications, you know, in manufacturing, where I've had to interface with test equipment. I've done. In, you know, test equipment design where we hook, you know, connect oscilloscopes and design better nails to test circuit boards. That, that there. So I've done probably almost every type of programming out there at one point. Other than, yeah, I've done database programming too. I've actually designed a couple of databases out there, which I've done a database programmer where I've used Fox Pro and Microsoft Access to design databases out there. We won't get into da databases in this class out there. I have never designed payroll systems or insurance systems or accounting systems. You know, I've never done that type of work. 90% of the programming I've done has been hardware oriented where it goes into a piece of equipment that there. So something like the engine controller of your automobile has a microprocessor that controls the timing when the spark plug set off, how much fuel gets pumped to the engine, all that is done by a microprocessor, and that's all programmed in C, right there. So, your, you know, if you've got a microwave in your home that's got an LCD display, I mean, we're talking something built in the next last 30 years. You know, the first microwaves that came out in the 1970s had like six buttons or ten. No, there was ten buttons that you picked the time level right there. You know, that there, those didn't have microprocessors right there. But now, you know, where you, where you tell it, you turn the knob, you want it to go three minutes at power level six, that there, and you've got a clock. Those are all microprocessor controlled, that there. You know, I've worked on those types of projects. Any washing machine that you've got that's got programmable settings on it, that's all microprocessor. That's the type of programming that I've done, that there is hardware control, that, that there. So, so that type of programming is different than desktop programming. So sometimes you, I'll talk about programming in this class and I'll talk about embedded systems. That's where you, we actually control hardware. And that's what makes C a difficult language is that C can do both. It's a mid-level language that there, and I'm just gonna kind of jump into the slides up there. But C, you could do desktop programming where you can design a large database. You can design an operating system with with C, 
you know, something like the Android operating system could be written in C, that there. A word processor such as Word or Excel, a spreadsheet, can be designed using C. But also the controller for your motor scooter or motorbike can also be done in C, that there. So C can do very low level things, it can do very high level things. So as a result, you can do things in C that you can't do in other languages such as uh, Fortran, Java, which are predominantly desktop applications out there. So, it, so it's all round language. It does everything, and because it does everything, you can break the rules and do some really silly things and get some really silly results that there. So, that there. So let me just kind of jump in here, and I'm just going to jump in and just kind of go through the first part of the slides right here, right here, and there. And I don't use a whiteboard. I have a stylus that I write on the screen that there. So that there. That's why I can get away with recording. Oh, there's something else on my screen right there. So this is introductions to computers in C++. That's not the title of the book. I don't know why the title of the slides are different than the title of the book. I evidently, he may have stole these slides from someone else. I mean, slides for classes of this type are passed around between instructors at their end. Some instructors feel that you have to design your own slides for a class. I tend to be one of these types of people that say, if, if I've got something that the publishers are willing to give me for free and it does the job, why do I want to spend 50 hours of my life redoing it <laughs> right there? So, right there. And you'll find that when, when you work in industry, that almost nobody expects you to redesign things that are already designed unless it's patented and you can't steal other people's patented designs out there. You know, out there. And same thing when you write lab reports, you can't steal things off the internet because that's supposed to be your own work. But in this case, you'll notice that there's a copyright notice on the bottom of this slide that there by Pearson. I am not claiming ownership to these slides. I did not write these slides. I did not design them that there. Pearson Education Group, who publishes the book, owns these. They are probably not written by the textbook author. I can almost guarantee they weren't. And the reason I know that is because I've made spare money on the, in the past by designing slides for textbooks. So, you know, a publisher will come to me and say, all right, you've been teaching this class, using this book, do you mind, you know, can we look at your slides? And they say, do you mind cleaning them up and, you know, we'll pay you 3000 or $2,000, so we're, we're going to use them for the textbook. So I've sold my slides to publishers in the past, out there, and I've never written the textbook out there. Okay. These are just some quotes he put there at the end. Right there. Okay, this is basically a chapter where we're going to look at all the great things in the fields, computer networking, network basis, that right there. This is just kind of introduction that right there. If you look at this particular set of objectives, that would be an entire course if we covered them all well. And we're going to cover them all probably today and next week right there. So... Okay, out there, and this is all out there. Okay, C++, it's a powerful computer programming that's appropriate for technically oriented people with little, or, and I will say that this is probably false right there, <laughs> out there. I would, tech, personally, as I said earlier, I would like to see people learn how to program with a much easier language beforehand. My favorite programming language for a first language is one that everyone laughs at me about, and that's Visual, Visual Basic, VB. The reason I like VB is because it's a graphical-oriented language, and you draw the menus and everything, and you can get very nice-looking programs with very little programming effort that there, and you still learn how to program. It gets people excited about programming. It's hard to get excited about programming when your first language is C++. You think it's a tedious, boring pain in the neck. Because it is a you know, a tedious, boring pain in the neck. 
But that's what we've got there. Okay, we write instructions for the computer to form tasks right there. So again, we're going to be writing instructions for computers to do something with there. A computer program is a series of instructions, not unlike a cookbook. Uh, I've got two gentlemen and one lady here. She's probably seen cookbooks. I don't know if you guys have ever looked at a cookbook or not, but uh, not there. But I'll use something else. You buy a piece of furniture, it comes with a set of instructions on how to put it together, right? Or you look up in a, in a manual on how to rebuild a carburetor for your... Well, of course, carburetors are obsolete, and now I'm really showing my age. <coughs> but there. But on how to change the oil on your motorcycle, right there. Right there. You know there's a series of steps you have to follow in order to change your oil on a motorcycle. Just as there's a series of steps you have to follow to make Nazi Lamat. Right there. If you put those instructions down on paper, you know, first you do this, next you do this, next you do this, there, you know, that's a algorithm. That's a series of instructions in order to, to accomplish a task. Right there. And that's what a computer program is. It's a series of instructions that we want the computer to do something. And we can either have it perform a calculation, that there, plot a graph, keep track of a, a customer's, you know, order at a, at a restaurant, or we can fly an aircraft, that there. You know, our computer program could do things as, such as set the altimeters a certain way, adjust the tail, adjust the adjust how much fuel goes to the jet engines, adjust the openings for the oxygen or the air going into the engines. So we have all kinds of things that computer programs do. You know, one of my summer jobs that I've had while I was you know, while I was at the university in the US is a little different. We're allowed to go out and get real jobs in the summertime instead of you know that there. So I've always worked someplace. I worked for General Electric and they designed engine controls right there. Now I happen to work for testing test engineering but I got my hands dirty playing with some engine controls out there. And jet, for those who are not familiar, General Electric makes about 50% of the engines that go on, you know, 747s, 707s, 777s, Airbus. Typically, most, air, most airlines, when they buy a aircraft from either Boeing or Airbus, they buy it without engines. And then they specify which engine they want. And there's about three or four manufacturers. General Electric's one of the larger ones. Rolls Royce is another one, and I can't remember. I think General Dynamics might be the third engine manufacturer. But, but, but you know, these engines all have microprocessors on them. They use an R microprocessor that the software is all written in C, right there. So again, we have to have a series of instructions that that particular processor there controls the hardware that operates the engine right there. So that's one type of program. Another type of program is Facebook is a computer application right there. It happens to originally be written in HTML. Now it's most of it's probably in Java right there. But it's a computer program that keeps track of everybody's <coughs> Facebook pages and whatever you message that there. So there. So software is a series of instructions that controls the hardware. Now you also hear the term mentioned once in a while in oh, I think it's actually this cable. I have not had this trouble. You'll hear the term mentioned firmware as well. So we've got three things to look at. Software. Software is our computer program out there. And it's typically you know, it's written in C or any other language. Hardware is something you can put your hands on, touch, feel, see, right there. And then firmware is somewhere in between. And what firmware typically is, is it's software that you program into a chip that goes into the physical hardware, right there. But it actually starts off as software, right there. So this class will not talk much about firmware. We'll only be talking about software in this class. I will probably show some demonstrations of some hardware and some microcontrollers out there. Object-oriented programming is a method of programming right there. That's what C++ is based on, is object-oriented programming. It sometimes confuses things, makes it more difficult. 
I am not I have not done a lot of object oriented programming, but I'm adapting this class to it last semester and I'm gonna continue the adaptation. So I'm actually learning object oriented programming a little bit with along with you guys here. I'm more of a procedural type programmer where I write procedures that do that and I call the procedures and I'll still and I still think that way because that's the way I learned how to program thirty five years ago. <laughs> And that's the way actually most of the embedded stuff is still done out there. So, okay. C++ is one of the most popular programming development languages. That is true. C++ is probably the most popular programming language for certain applications. The number one most popular programming language out there is the one that everyone laughs at, and that's probably Visual Basic. Visual Basic is used more times than not for quick and dirty programming. And knowing that you're going to be, that you're electrical engineers and you're not computer science majors, you're not computer, enge computer engineers, if you're electrical engineers or even electronic engineers, chances are if you're going to write a program, it's most likely going to be a Visual Basic. That's there. So, the good news is once you learn C++, going back and learning Visual Basic is like learning to drive, you know, ride a little scooter after you've owned a Harley Davidson, right there. I've never owned a Harley Davidson, so I'm st I struggled when I bought my little Vespa out there. I ride a little sc scooter that there uh, around town, and I had to learn how to ride that <laughs> that there, you know. But I've never owned a motorcycle with gears or anything. Actually, I bought one so that I can pass the stupid motorcycle test here, <laughs> at there, which I've yet to pass that there because I haven't found the time to get out there on the little, you know, what they call it, chunk chai bike? What's that term for a piece of crap? Cup chai? Yeah. I, I just call it a, a POS, piece of, piece, of, piece of crap. Only S is a, the more unpolite word for crap right there. POC, piece of crap. That, it's a little debark or whatever it is. Ninety. I mean, I, I bought it for two thousand. You know, you know, I say, yeah. what what do they call that? A license plate interchange bike. Someone bought it to hold the plate number and then never rode it. And then out there, oh, the maid is or a second cleaning person is wanting to come in here and clean the room. <laughs> out there, but I you know, I bought it for that purpose. But regardless, you know. Learning to ride a Harley Davidson or a large motorcycle with, you know, five gears or whatever in a clutch is not a trivial thing. I mean, it's a big bike and it weighs five, six hundred pounds. And if you knock it over, picking the thing back up is a pain in the neck. That there, where use learning to ride a little Honda PCX or a Vespa or one of the what's the Yamaha Ergo Ego Ergo scooters, you know, the little, that don't have any gears, all you have is a throttle and the brake, you know, that there. So going from C++ is like going from the Harley Davidson down to the Vespa, that there. It's, you know, one, you know, it's much, much, it's a much easier language. So even though I say that Visual Basic is probably the number, the most likely language that you'll use, it, that there, I don't feel shortchanging you by not teaching you Visual Basic because it's very, fairly easy. The reason I Visual Basic so popular is it's a quick and dirty language. You know, if you want to do something, you want to plot something, you want to put up a menu, I can I can write a Visual Basic program in probably ten minutes. To do the same program in C plus plus would probably take me two to three hours. Right there. Now I have more control in the C plus plus. And I get in the hardware, but if all I want to do is plot plots of data, I'm either going to grab MATLAB or Visual Basic right there. I'm not going to waste my time developing a large C++ application right there. C++ I consider for real work. That there, most of the programming that you're going to do when you graduate is probably not going to be what I call real work in terms of the program is got a particular application. You've got a transmission line, you're trying to find the fault in it, you've got some equations, you want to write a computer program to do, do the calculations. 
you're, you're not going to sell it on the market. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be elaborate. You're not going to control it. You just want to get the job done quickly as possible. Visual Basic is the tool for that right there. If I want to write something that I want to put up on the Android store and sell 500,000 copies of it and make 50 cents per copy so I can get you know, filthy rich with my new Android game, then I'm going to want to make sure that it's clean and very, very, you know, it's bug free. Then I'm going to be use, using something like C++ or Java or Python or one of the other languages that are designed more for these larger applications. But like electrical engineers and even most electronic engineers, unless you're getting into embedded stuff, probably aren't going to be doing that kind of programming. So there's different levels of programming skills required. So that's why that the the ISO, you know, we're on C plus plus eleven. I don't care about any of that stuff. That there, there are a billion general purpose computers and a billion more cell phones, smartphones out there. That is probably an understatement. Out there, general purpose computers are what's sitting in front of me right there. Now this is a hybrid. It's a tablet slash laptop that runs Windows ten. I consider this a general purpose computer. What's in front of you is definitely a general purpose computer. I consider a smartphone a general purpose computer anymore. Right there. Because a smartphone is a computer that happens to make phone calls is one of its applications right there. And when I first started, you know, I want to go way back to when I first wrote my first computer program, which was when I was probably 10th grade in high school. That right there, so I would have been probably 15, 16 years old when I wrote my, that there, and that was using punch cards on a mainframe, which our high school spot share time on the mainframe. That right there, that computer had about 1k of RAM. Right there, my first computer that I owned, that I bought, was a Commodore VIC 20. And it had 2K of RAM. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the difference between K and Meg and Gig, 2K is 2,000 memory bytes. 2 Meg is 2 million memory bytes. 2 Giga is 2 billion memory bytes, right there. It goes up by a factor of 1,000. My current desktop computer I use for at home that I do, do most of my work on, it's got 32 gig of RAM today. That there is what I run that there. You know, my little laptop here, it's got eight gig of RAM. My first computer had 2K. So computers have gone a long ways. My cell phone has, where my cell phone is, down there it is, it's got three gig of RAM. Yeah, it's, yeah the Samsung Notes, This I've got Note 4, I think it's got three gig three gig out there. I, I'm thinking some of the newer ones coming out with four gig of RAM. Apple still uses two gig on their phones out there. But regardless, there are, there's far more RAM and applications in a modern cell phone than there was in a computer system of only 10 years ago out there. You know, if I go back 20 years ago, the 386 was just now coming out out there. 486. I think well, the 486 was out 20 years ago, right there, and that was a single core processor. Today's arms and cell phones are like six times as powerful, right there. So, so again, we're looking at that. There, regardless, there's a lot of computers out there. Bottom line, there's a bunch of computers out there. There's billions of computers out there, and what's not listed in here is the number of embedded systems that probably outnumbers the number of computers that are all programmed in languages such as C. That there. If I look at my house and I look at the non-computer type devices that have computers in them, it's almost a four to one, five to one to the computers that there that I have in the house. Because you know most homes have a computer and a cell phone, right? That's the average person. I'm a little worse. I got a computer, a tablet, a, 
he had a laptop, a, a, a cell phone, an e-book reader. I mean, I've got all kinds of devices that I, that I'm a gadget person that there. But if I look at my house and I look at my cable modem, you know, for watching TV, that's got a full-blown computer system in it. My wife went and bought one of these little devices or nephew showed her where she can get uh, TV stations that we won't get into legality of these things that these little IPTV boxes has anybody, has anybody heard of those things? That they're, they're little Android boxes that you plug into your TV and you plug your Ethernet into them and it allows you to get channels from India and Indonesia and all that stuff completely I, th I think it's completely pirated <laughs> that there I mean I don't it's not Astro. Astro is is a legal operation. This is completely questionable because for I think it's like fifty ringgits for like three months subscription, you get all the HBOs and Stars and all that stuff. That there, uh, regardless, you bought the box. That's got a full blown computer in it. My television system is a high definition flat screen. It's got a computer system in it. It's actually got a very high-end processor in it. Got there. My, my, uh, ju -ju I don't have Astro. I've got the other one, uh, Unify. That's, that's got a computer in it right there. Let's see. My wife's got a sewing machine. It's got a computer in it anymore. It's got a little LCD display for all the various stitches. She's got another device called a, what, what do they call that thing? It's for edging out there. Out there. Well, we don't have anybody to sew it, but... At, at their stitcher or stretcher or something like that. I don't know what, 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 what it is. But it's also got a computer in it right there. Uh, let's see. I've got a scanner. It's got its own computer in it. My printer's got its own computer, although I've got a scanner printer out there. My refrigerator does not have a computer because my ref refrigerator is an old refrigerator I brought from the U.S. So, there. My freezer, on the other hand, does have a computer in it. I have an upright freezer that's got electronic, it's got the little LCD display on the front, it tells the temperature and all that stuff up there. So the freezer has actually got computerized control on it up there. Uh, my microwave oven's got it, it's got up there. I mean, several of the other kitchen appliances I've got up there. My car has got at least one computer in it, right there, because I got a GPS system in the car up there. I've also got a rear backup camera on the car. So th those are probably two computer-based systems. I've got an alarm system wherever I back up. If I get too close to my wife's laundry hanging, it starts beeping at me, right? Uh, that there. So you, as you look around, these are all computerized. That there. So I would say being of the generation that microprocessors was developed when I was about 15 years old. The microprocessor came around in the early 70s, right there, late 60s. I was born in 1956, so I was like 14, 15 years old when processors came out. So I remember life before computerized. Computers were in everyday life. Out there. Back when telephones had a little wheel that you, that, that, that you dialed, and they were connected to the wall by a cord out there. You know, cars had points for adjusting the timing, and, and you had to tune the car by turning the distributor to where the points would fire at the right time. <clears throat> your fuel pump would your you'd have a fuel pump, and you'd have a carburetor that would be manually adjusted right there. So, I remember life before computers. Right there, you in this room, and I don't take this wrong. You have never known life without computers. You've never seen a world without computers. Unless somebody here grew up in Sarawak in the jungle and didn't see a computer until they came to KL the first time. But I would say even in most people that live in Sarawak or Saba, even in the jungle, are now seeing cell phones and, and iPads and things like that. So that there. So it, it's been a, and it, it's been an amazing journey for somebody my age to watch how computers have changed the world, and it has definitely changed the world and it changed the way students think it changes the way people think it changes the way we live some of that you might hear some of some old folks say not necessarily for the better that there okay going through the 
up there, and I'm probably going to wrap up before too long. Up there, I usually don't talk more than an hour and 15 minutes because my throat starts to dry out. And see, that's why I had that coffee. Okay, some other stuff up there. These are old slides, so it says by 2013. Actually, it's kind of funny because the, the date of the slides is 2014, but that there they were obviously written by before, what before 2013. Set there, smartphones. This was an important event. Is that the number of smartphones passed the number of computers sold, and that goes for what I said earlier. I consider a smartphone a computer. That there. What is probably the most endangered piece of hardware out today is probably this thing right here, the desktop computer. That is probably at far more risk of disappearing than almost any other piece of equipment. Smartphones have eliminated so many markets out there. If you look at the things that smartphones have replaced, watches, I still use a watch. Out there. I see a couple of, I see some of you still use watches. A lot of my students in the U.S. don't wear watches anymore. Out there. Why? They want to see the time they look at their phone, right? Alarm clocks. You know, my wife still you, still owns an alarm clock. She went out and bought an alarm clock. The battery went dead and she never replaced it. That, that there. But she had to have an alarm clock. Since then, she's figured out how to use her cell phone as the alarm clock right there. Cell phones are there. Another device that's been been replaced has been the pocket camera. Now I still use a regular camera and I still have a digital single lens, a DS digital single lens reflex that there because I still think that they take better pictures than phone cameras that there and they do. I'll be honest, my little Sony point and shoot takes much better pictures than you know you know my niece's iPhone. You know she swears by her iPhone six and says it's a, takes really great pictures and I put next to it the ones from a real camera and the ones from the real camera are much better out there. But the difference is is that she, her iPhone is always in her pocket. My camera is rarely in my pocket when I'm out. So so the uh, smartphone out there. Uh, watches that there. You know, I can take my pulse rate, check my oxygen level. My phone keeps track of how many steps I make. You know, that there. It yells at me if I'm too lazy and, and uh, haven't walked by 6,000 steps in a day. That, that there. So smartphones have replaced a lot of other that there. Um, now I'm seeing that smartphones are replacing the key for cars. That there. You can take your smartphone that's got uh, near near field communications and just put it up to the key key on some some of the modern cars. You don't need a key to get in your car. Your smartphone is, is your key right there. And then once you're in the car, you just push a button and start. There's no key in the car anymore right there. So so we're starting to see a lot of things disappearing that there because of the smartphones replacing that there. The smartphone app, again, old numbers. Now, they said by 2014, it was expected to go over 40 billion. I don't know how, what it was in 2014. I'm, I suspect that that number was probably low. The only thing about the smartphone app market is that most people don't want to pay a lot for a smartphone app, right there. You know, if you buy an app for your phone, the most you're going to spend with two, three ringgits. That there, you're not going to spend a lot. It's, most apps sell for less than a dollar U.S. Right there. So that's four under four ringgits. That there. Where a program such as Microsoft Office for a desktop computer might sell for two or three hundred US, USD, right there. So desktop computer applications tend, tend to be much more expensive than that there. So okay. So one of the huge markets, and I've known some people. I've never capitalized on it. I keep saying that's going to be my retirement gig is sitting down writing mobile apps. Right there, uh, you know. The thing about a mobile app is that they tend to be small. They tend to be easy to program. And you just got to find the niche for it. You know, so that there. You know, if you have an app that can easily go and download the, you know, the, the daily exchange rates that I put in, how much an item costs in RM, and it gives me the U.S. equivalent. That's a very powerful app for me to have on my phone. Right there. 
because a lot of my savings and a lot of my income still comes from the U.S. So when I want to buy something, I want to know how much does that cost me in USD because I still think in USD right there. On the other hand, if you go to Singapore and you want to buy something in Singapore, you want to know how much it costs in RM. So the same app that there. But, you know, that, that's a very low-power app. It does one thing. It converts currencies right there. Not very difficult to write. But if you write a clean one, a smooth one, now I don't say you're going to get rich because there's probably 50 currency converters out there today, right there. And, you know, some are very good, some are very bad. And you're not going to get rich off of currency converters software today because someone's already beat you to the market but you know an app to keep track of how how far how much you walk every day on your phone right there you know those types of things that there and there are people that got have gotten very wealthy on that on some of these apps that there okay the last two decades that there and I don't know what they say many of the most important of the last two decades we could probably almost say four decades right there. I mean, <laughs> that there. IBM started off as the, I can't even remember the name, but it was something tabulation company, and they made cash registers back in the 1920s, 1930s. That there. They entered the computer market in the 1960s, right there. Hewlett Packard started out making test equipment back in the 1930s, right, 40s. So that there. Intel was started by a young a group of hardware engineers back in the 1960s late 60s early 70s so that their Motorola used to make radios back in the 1950s they made a lot of police radios and military radios right there Cisco of course is relatively new Microsoft you know they came with their own in the 1970s right there Google is relatively young Amazon's relatively young Facebook's young the rest of these are fairly young, right there, right there. But again, some of these, some that there. Apple, of course, was in the '70s, that right there. So when I say they say the last two decades, I'm going to say we got to go back, really, to 1972, 71, when really the computer industry started taking off, the microprocessor, that right there. So many of these companies employ lots and lots of people. Motorola, for example, is still in, has got a huge plant here in KL. It's no longer called Motorola. How many of the three of you have ever been out to uh, PJ Battalion Jaya? Not there, but you'll see a large company called Freescale right there. They make microprocessors. That used to be Motorola. Freescale was a part of Motorola. It was sold off right there. Dell used to have a plant in Malacca. I don't think they, they're there anymore. Intel, I know, has a several plants in Malacca where they make microprocessors. So, again, a lot of, there's a lot of these companies in the local region. And their Amazon is in India now. They're not in Malaysia yet. For those who don't know what Amazon is, they're an online shopping company. They are probably my favorite shop, place to buy things from is Amazon. I love Amazon. And Lazada is not... Amazon. That there, I bought. I bought from Lazada and I bought from Amazon, and they are completely different from each other. Amazon, I can log on, buy something, and it shows up at my house within a day or two, all without fail. If I don't like it, I put it back in the box. I send it back, and I get my money back with no questions asked. That there, Lazada. I've had things take four or five weeks to get to me. And if I had problems with it, it's like pull, it's almost impossible to get any kind of you know, customer service up there. I, I refer to it as customer non-service up there, up there because there. But Amazon is, is a company. Foursquare is one that's used. It's kind of, I hate Foursquare to be honest with you. Foursquare, you got to be careful because it keeps track of everywhere you've been. <laughs> up there. And if it sees you walk by a restaurant, a little message comes up and says. Did you eat there? You know, give us a rating. And you just wonder how big their database is of every place you've gone. That there. If, you know, that there, so that there. Yahoo's a company that's been in trouble. That there, you know. I'm not sure if they're going to survive. eBay has been around a long time. And that there, so, but again, these are major employers of people who study that there. 
again, Malaysia has a lot of companies that are in the IT hardware business. My wife's nephew, or actually her niece's husband, I don't know what, the, what you call him out there, we just say our nephew, he works for Texas Instruments there in Carbon AU, that there, and again, they make ICs for various purposes, that there. So again, he used to work at Freescale. So again, there's a lot of employees, a lot of jobs created by this industry out there. <clears throat> and this is probably one of the better paid industries for the manufacturing sector. That <coughs> so you will consider, see Malaysia continue to strive for these types of companies, because these types of jobs tend to pay fairly well out there. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop at this point that there, my throat is giving out on me. Up there, so I will. I only talk for forty-five minutes since I record, started the recording. This is a first class; no one's going to remember it. Up there, and there's nothing on the final exam from this class anyway. <laughs>